problem with those measures.
in your kingdom. Lord, give us wisdom and understanding. And Lord, we just ask as a church that you help us meet our needs on a weekly, monthly basis. Thank you, Father, for your provision. Amen. Amen. Now we come and celebrate this morning. And who we celebrate? And we celebrate the King of Kings, Jesus, Majesty. Let's sing and let's worship this morning. Majesty. Worship is majesty.
That's why he gave it the following of the Godson Son, so that the relationship of sin with God the Father could be restored and restored even more. I went to the hospital the other day and I saw a poster outside their church in Liverpool. Some of you might have seen it. It said, If God had a fridge, he would have a picture of you on it. sing another song this morning. Father, into your hands I place into your hands reading this morning and uh, the first reading is taken um, from uh, <coughs> our first reading this morning old age does not come up in heaven our first reading is taken from 1 Timothy, verses 1, verse 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 20. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people 
not to teach false doctrines any longer, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversy, speculation, rather than advancing God's word, which is by faith. The goal, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from me and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders, for liars and perjurers, and, what, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which is entrusted to me. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. <coughs> Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might be displayed, display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive Now the King, the eternal, the immortal, invisible, and the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Pardon me, the next day. Pride goes before destruction, um, which is taken from Proverbs. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. So, before we start, let's have a look at some of why this book was written, who wrote it. Well, it was obviously written by Paul, an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he was commanded by God to write this. He wrote it to Timothy. And he impressed upon Timothy certain things. That they were false teachers. Probably Paul dealt with the false teachers himself when he was there. But when he went, he entrusted that to Timothy. And likewise, Christ is by the right hand side of the Father. And he is entrusted his church to each of us today to uphold that gospel, that true gospel. We are not called to please the world. We are called to please God. To please God. That is why the gospel is given. Paul calls Timothy a true son in the faith. He 
said, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. A true son of faith, or daughter of faith, whichever you would say. Paul considered Timothy to be that person, to be a true son of faith. Because he probably led him and his mother to faith. Paul knew Timothy well. But what does it mean to be a true child or son or daughter of faith? Well, to have faith, first thing, you have to be childlike. Childlike. It's a precious gift bestowed upon us by God. It's not something we can have ourselves. It is a pure and innocent belief that transcends all logic and all reason, allowing us to fully trust in the power and goodness of God. That's what faith is. Trusting in God. In a world filled with scepticism, conspiracy theories, and doubt, embracing a childlike faith is like opening a door to a realm where miracles will happen and dreams will come. When we approach God with the heart of a child, we surrender our need for control and humbly accept his guidance and his provision. We become like little ones, eagerly seeking his presence, eagerly anticipating his love and grace. We explore the beauty and strength of faith like a child. We trust that God knows best, not in just the little things, but in everything. God knows best. We have to have trust and unwavering belief, and then we will discover the kind of faith that can transform others' lives and ours. So, in a, in a couple of words, what does it mean? It means to have a simple, unwavering trust in our Heavenly Father. Can we all say that? Just as children trust their parents completely, without doubt and hesitating, until they become teenagers, by the way. Then everything changes. Then we get that, I know better than you. But in some ways, in our Christian lives, do we not even act like that ourselves? Thinking we know better than he who created the whole universe. We set ourselves up as being something we are not. We forget we are called to be humble. That we are called to surrender to his will. We are called to trust God. To come to him with humility and surrender. It is about surrendering our own understanding and relying on his wisdom and guidance. We must come to God with a heart that is open, teachable, and full of wonder, just like a child. That he could love us ere we ever love him and give his son that we might live. Having a childlike faith means embracing the truth that we are helpless without God <coughs> and that he is our loving and all-powerful Father who cares for us deeply and he does care for us deeply. That means believing his promises and having the confidence to ask him <coughs> for everything in our lives. Can somebody pass my water, please? I'm sorry to be a phone, but I seem to have a frog in my throat. <coughs> it means believing his promises, as I just said, and having the confidence to ask him for anything, knowing that he hears us 
and desires to give us good things. But not just that, Paul goes on and he talks about grace and mercy and peace. This is very often a very familiar greeting that Paul uses in his letters to congregations. Here he applies it to an individual. God grants his grace, mercy and peace, not only to churches, but to individuals who make up that, those churches. Yet there is a difference. When Paul wrote to the churches, he commonly greeted them with grace and peace. But to Timothy he added mercy and peace. Why? We all need God's mercy to move in this world, to survive in this world. We cannot survive without God's mercy, my friends. This world is a very hard place. Somebody said to me the other day, <coughs> but you sin. <coughs> I said, I know I do. I don't want to. Nobody who's a Christian wants to sin, but we do. And I said to them, <coughs> when I stand before the throne of grace, and I pray it's not going to be for a good few years yet, and my life is explored. There will be failures. There will be times when I was disobedient to my Father in heaven. When I couldn't face the tasks that he asked me to do, I was scared. But there will also be mercy. That Christ will intercede and say, this is mine. It is mine. And God will say, welcome, good and faithful servant. We all need the mercy of the cross. We all need that mercy every single day of our lives. We need that mercy that God showed when he sent his son to die for us. If we do not accept that mercy, We will not be able to do the things that God calls us to do. Unless we know we are forgiven and we stand in the righteousness of Christ. And we are called to minister in hard places. To minister in hard places. This world does not revere God. I remember years ago when I went in hospital and they would say, Church of England? And everybody would say yes. Or Church in Wales? Now there are more people saying, no, I don't have any belief at all. It's our job to stand in those hard places, my friend. To keep the true doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ alive. To keep the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ alive. We are called. We stand in that hard place. But how can we do that? We can do it by trusting God, having faith in Him, accepting His grace and His mercy and His peace. Because when we have peace with God, we are one with Him. And nobody can stand against us. Christ very clearly said, said that if God is for you, who can stand against you? No one. No. So we need to be people who seek <coughs> to have that faith, to have that grace, to have that mercy. Yes. And we know that none of us are worthy. We're all unworthy of that great gift that has been given. But it's because we serve a great God that we have that grace, that mercy, that peace. Because we serve a God who 
loves us so much that he laid his son's life down that we might live. If we open our hearts to God, we will see amazing things happen. If we stand for the true doctrine, the true gospel, we will see people's lives transformed. You know, somebody said to me, I know of God. I said, very good. I spoke to somebody in the hospital. I know of God. Do you? Yes. I said, so does the devil. The devil knows God. He said, but I know Jesus as well. I said, do you, brother? Do you really know him? He said, yes, I know of him. I said, you keep saying of him. Do you know him? as your personal saviour. That's a meaningful. That he died for you to forgive your sins. I said, because even the devil knows Jesus. And Jesus knows the devil. But you need to know him personally. He needs to be your personal Savior. You don't need to know of Him. <coughs> you need to truly know Him and surrender to Him. Now that didn't change that man's life then, but I pray a seed was planted. <coughs> and that the Holy Spirit will <coughs> water that spirit water that word and make it grow. And that's what we have, my friends, when we <coughs> surrender to God and we accept the grace and the mercy and the peace of God. It is then we have the fullness of the Spirit of God. It is then we have His fullness we are one with him. We could do nothing, my dear friends, on our own. Only fail. But with the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see amazing things happen. Amazing things. God is waiting. God is waiting for us to surrender. For his perfect peace, his perfect love, to fill our hearts to overflowing with faith in him, to surrender our lives to him, to change, not to pay lip service. Yeah, 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 I've heard all this a hundred times. A preacher said that 24 months ago. But has it had any impact? It's no good just sitting here and coming up and saying, lovely sermon, minister. That's not what it's about. If we are serious about God, we're called to be transformed. Transformed into perfect images of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to put on the cloak of Christ. Are we? We say we want revival. Like I've said before, if I hear one person, more person say about revival, I think I scream. We will never have revival until we are right before God. And you can forget it. Because till we're one with the Father, He can't work with cracked vessels. He's pouring His Spirit out today in this place now. But it's no good having a bowl with a crack in it. Because if water runs out, spirit will just run out the most. We need to be whole before God. Totally surrendered, accepted His grace, His peace, His love. And then He can heal. We do not uphold the true gospel. If we allow false doctrines to be taught, then we 
can know better than the worst of sinners. If we bend the gospel just to make people feel right, then I'm sorry, we've lost the battle. We need to be a people who uphold the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true gospel. We don't need to worry about powers and principalities. God says our battles are against them. We need to be opening our heart to Jesus here, now, this morning. We need to be surrendering to God and stop paying lip service to him because he doesn't need that he needs people who are true who have a faith in him who accept his grace his love and his Somebody standing up front for us, lovely prayer, but not too valued. Doesn't appear to us. So, what I want you to do this morning is get into a small group. And we're going to have a little time of prayer. And pray what God puts on your heart, whether it's for each other, for this fellowship, for people in need, or for those who are going through a cancer treatment. And um, Carol, who is not here this morning, she's ill. She's ill, my wife, she's had an MRI this morning. She came to an for prayer, she's been waiting ages for this, and she told Cameron on Wednesday. Cameron's faithful in the uh, car park where she works. The next thing she knows, she gets a phone call for an MRI from the phone from the morning. It's an answer for prayer. God answers our prayers. So we're going to get into small groups and let's just pray on what God lays on your heart. And if you want prayer yourself and you want specific prayer, you want to come to a bloke and Mike has prayed for you. Pray for the needs of our nation. Pray for the peace in Gaza, for the Ukraine. Pray for our BMS missionaries.
Lord, I know you 